want to welcome all the people online. Uh, we really appreciate you. We're sticking to the non-pharmaceutical non protocols for uh, COVID uh, precautions. Uh, that's why I'm keeping my mask, but I'll take it out now. Uh, please uh, continue using your mask, especially now. Uh, social distancing, and uh, when you don't need to gather, please uh, don't. We just don't want to have this fourth wave. Uh, the numbers are starting to creep in. Uh, please, uh, uh, let's all make sure that uh, we enjoy our holidays. And, uh, uh, and this, was, this uh, fourth wave, we, we stop it dead on our tracks. It's all in our hands uh, to do that. So welcome again in the ULP uh, Authors Forum. Uh, I'm particularly pleased today uh, that we're having this session, but before that, I, I never stop to remind you why we have Authors Forum. Uh, this ULP Authors Forum is a program that is aimed at unleashing, particularly, the writing culture. And we want to equip, encourage, empower the next generation of authors. It is always said, as we know, if the lions do not learn how to write, every story of the lion will glorify the hunter. That's the true statement and the true uh, narrative, especially we in Africa. I mean, I was uh, uh, studying the Mapungukwe area. If you go there, you can see that already there was a lot of civilization in our continent, uh, the kind of technology that was already there, but we didn't write it down. We didn't write books about it, and, uh, and it disappeared. And all the people who could write, uh, uh, continue to write, particularly uh, in Europe and uh, in the US, and that's why we're writing about civilization uh, in, in the, about those areas. So the last reason why we have this forum uh, is to really encourage that we move away from the oral culture while it's good to tell stories, but we need to transmit our stories, our thoughts, our ideas, and our wisdom more in writing so that the next generation and the next generation will always build on it. So that's the real reason why we're here. So today I'm very pleased. Uh, first, let me welcome Confidence. He doesn't need any con oh, introduction. He's a confident, <laughs> confident <laughs> uh, author, writer, publisher, extremely gifted young man. And uh, I thank you for this program. This year it has run uh, very well. And this is our last one. Uh, so, uh, but I want to introduce my colleague here. And I'm very excited about what uh, he, he has uh, achieved. Uh, he's written this book. I call him Bramil, essentially, uh, so I break protocol. Uh, <laughs> protocol is, uh, is Professor. <laughs> <laughs> professor Mil Soko, South Africa, and the world. What I like is that the world. So he's got a global perspective, a political economy journey through time. Let me tell you about Professor Mil Soko. Um, he's an, he's an, our Professor at Vest, Vest Business School, you see, I'm even saying our, because uh, <laughs> uh, uh, I'm, uh, as the head of the school, I'm very passionate about Vest Business School. Uh, those that are listening uh, from Vest Business School, welcome. Uh, but he's a professor of international business and strategy. And uh, he's got a great uh, CV. He's a member of the editorial boards of Global Governance, General of Common Market Studies and Africa Growth Agenda. He previously served as a member of Evian's Group's Council of Global Thought Leaders. He formerly chaired the board of South African Institute of Advancement. He's a member of advisory boards of Namibia Business School and Tsiba Business School. He's also a member of the board of the Field Band Foundation. He previously chaired a working group on education and employment under the auspices of Africa-German Partnership. And, initi and the initi this initiative uh, was under the president of the Federal Republic 
of German. You remember uh, Kordler. Uh, he was a, 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 a very, a, a president of German for many, many years. He was a, a member of Huawei Commission on the Future of the Multilateral Trading System. He's an ardent writer on local and global issues. Uh, he's a columnist of uh, Fin24 uh, Fin and also writes regularly for local newspapers, including Business Day, Daily Maverick, Sunday Times, Business Times, Financial Mail, and The, and the Conversation Africa. He's always on uh, current affairs programs on radio and television, uh, whether it's SAF, SAFM, uh, SABC, and, uh, and, and all the channels that we have in South Africa, including ENCA, Weekend Breakfast, Cape Talk, and Newsroom Africa. So I'm very pleased to welcome uh, Professor Mel Soko. My brother, I'm very proud of you. you know, you've really done us proud, uh, proud in, on two fronts. First, as an as a, as a African academic, a scholar of note, uh, but also as a business school, that's business school. <laughs> you're promoting us, uh, you're putting <laughs> business school on the map. Yeah. And that's what we said. We said uh, business school, that's business school is going to be number one business school in the continent. And you are leading us in that charge. Uh, thank you very much. Let's welcome Professor Mills. Professor Mills, uh, you've been welcome, but allow me to welcome you once again to ULP Authors Forum. Thank you so much for gracing us in that. Thank you very much. Um, uh, good evening, um, confidence. I um, would like to, to take this opportunity to thank um, Maurice, Professor Hadebe, yes, who's sir. my boss yes. at Vest Business School, uh, and to thank you and everybody who's here for providing me with this opportunity uh, to talk about my book on this uh, impressive leadership platform. Um, I've read about it a lot, and we, we, and we talk about some of the, the leaders who have, you know, who have come through here and um, um, participated in the leadership program. So it's a, it's a fantastic privilege for me uh, to be here, and I look forward to having a conversation with you. Thank you, thank you so much, Prof. I know you're raring to get into the book, <laughs> but before we do that, uh, can you give us a brief background of, of who Professor Mills is? You know, before there was Professor Mills, there was uh, Milford Sock. Yeah. So take us yeah. way, way back, yeah. uh, your upbringing, just a brief preview of your upbringing, uh, and what has led you into the academic uh, sphere? Yes, um, I, was, I was born in Malaseni, um, in Whitbank. Yes, sir. Uh, and I grew up there, I went to school there. I was born uh, in 1968, so I'm probably <laughs> older than you are. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and uh, I grew up during a very, um, a very difficult period uh, in South Africa, very challenging, uh, a lot of uh, uh, my peers will, uh, um, will relate to that. That was the height of the apartheid system. And um, um, we went through what was called Bantu education. So we experienced that firsthand, what Bantu education was all about. Mm -hmm. um, but we, we survived it. Uh, and that is because we had the belief that uh, if we were to defeat apartheid, we had to make sure that we had an education. We did not have all the uh, advantages that uh, uh, many young people have today, but we had uh, a very good mindset in terms of what we wanted to do. So I, I grew up there, I went to school there, and then uh, after high school, I went to uh, UCT. I went to study at UCT and, um, you know, the journey, the political economy journey that I, I refer to here started at UCT. And, uh, and then from there, I went to 
uh, parliament. You know, I was, I did work in the private sector. I don't talk about this here, but I worked in the <laughs> private sector for, I was there for six months <laughs> at, uh, yeah, at Old Mutual. <laughs> and I realized it, this was not for me. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so and I, get out. So I, 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 you know, graciously, um, woke up one day and went to work and told him that I'm leaving. Yeah. Um, this is not for me. But uh, <laughs> a lot of my experience has been in the in the think tank sector, uh, in, a, in in government. I was uh, in in parliament. I worked as an official in parliament uh, during the uh, what is called the class of '94. Uh -huh. uh, you know the the Mandela class, the Mbeki class. Mm. So I was. Uh, I worked as an official there, as a, as a, a, a policy advisor, as a researcher. And um, I um, then uh, left parliament. I reached a point where I thought um, I had outgrown parliament and I wanted more challenges and I continued with my studies. I went to Stellenbosch, first to do an MA, my first MA, International Studies. Mm. And then uh, that was followed by another MA in international political economy in the United Kingdom at the University of Warwick. Mm. And that was uh, subsequently followed by uh, doctoral studies um, in, the, in the UK also. So uh, this has been the journey that, mm. that uh, I've, I've undertaken. I came back uh, to South Africa in 2005 mm. and I joined UCT, Graduate School of Business in 2006. And I was there until I um, joined the uh, Vets Business School in 2019. Yes. So this is where, in essence, um, the, the summary of, of, of my personal, personal journey. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that, Prof. And the book, uh, what inspired the book and, and what, what gave you the, the motivation to say, let me put this book together? Interestingly, you know, the, the idea of this, of writing this book came about during a conversation mm. I had with a colleague uh, and friend, uh, Professor Mzugisi Kobo. Uh, Professor Hadebi will know Professor Kobo because they are both our bosses at, <laughs> uh, at, UC, at, uh, at VETS. Uh, he's the head of the VET School of Governance. And he, we were just before the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic in 2019. Yes. We sat down in Rosebank over a cup of coffee and he said to me, you know what, I've been thinking. And I said, what are you thinking? <laughs> he said, I think you should write a book. Yeah. And I said, why? He says, look, um, I've followed you for many years. You know, he met me when I was doing my, the first year of my doctoral studies. And I had gone to the uh, Department of Trade and Industry to do some uh, research interviews. He was a government official. Mm -hmm. He was in the DTI. And he told me that he had started following my writings mm -hmm. uh, you know, over the last 20 years or so. But he started then following me. And he thought there's a lot of what I've, I've written over the years and the issues that have animated my public writings that he thought uh, I should share with a broader South African public and that uh, those insights uh, a lot of people would find interesting. So that is how the, uh, uh, the book uh, started. And um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a book that is a, essentially, it reflects my, it's an attempt to chronicle my political economy journey. Uh, it is made up of a, uh, eight chapters, looking at, you know, arranged thematically, uh, looking at various topics, leadership, uh, business ethics, trade. Those are issues that, that have really animated me uh, over the years. Uh, it's a, it's a, a book that talks about South Africa, but it's not uh, exclusively about South Africa. I think uh, uh, this is something I need to, to, to highlight. It's a, it's a book that looks at the world through the lens of South Africa and the lessons that we can learn uh, as a country. Uh, and uh, the main motivation, confidence for me in writing this book is to demonstrate two things. One is to demonstrate something that we all know but we don't emphasize uh, enough. One is that leadership and governance matter. Uh, Maurice likes to say leadership is everything, and it is correct. Leadership and governance matters. And 
this is whether in a national context or international context. So this is not just about South Africa. I'm not whinging about South Africa. I'm locating South Africa within the broader global political economy. And uh, when one talks about leadership, uh, it's not just about the governance failures in this country. We have seen also governance failures elsewhere in the world. Uh, and I, I, I like to make the example of, uh, of, uh, of the United States under the, the Trump administration, which was a colonial, colossal governance uh, you know, uh, failure. And also there are other leaders today, uh, when you look at uh, Brazil under the current president, Jair Bolsonaro, it's a complete disaster. The other leaders in Hungary, you know, Viktor Orban and many other leaders. So it's to highlight the importance of leadership and governance. The other point I wanted to highlight through this book is that we should not, as South Africans, be self-obsessed you know, obsessed and self-absorbed with our problems. We tend to think that our problems and our challenges are exclusive. Yeah. They're not. So the book looks at how other countries have also experienced challenges and similar problems, but they've been able to deal with them. And you know, countries like China and, and, uh, and Singapore, and why it is important that these countries have succeeded is because of leadership. They provide leadership. They have the right leadership. And governance matters to these countries. Just on that, uh, Prof, uh, it is said, I believe it was uh, John C. Maxwell who said, everything rises and falls on leadership. And during the tenure of uh, our former president, Jacob Zuma, mm. I believe there was more falling than, than rising, <laughs> uh, particularly when it comes to matters pertaining to the economy. And in the first chapters of your book, you reflect on one of the catastrophes uh, economic catastrophes uh, during that tenor, the firing of Nkantlanene, which shook the markets. It was an earthquake in the market. Uh, can you reflect on that uh, as you do in the book? Yeah. I don't want to personalize this uh, confidence. Uh, I don't want to single out uh, former President Zuma, although he has to take responsibility for uh, what happened during his reign yeah. as president. But uh, he's a microcosm of a broader problem is just a, a manifestation of a broader problem, which has to do with the, as we have seen over the, uh, the past few, few months, uh, especially in July, when we had an eruption of riots. Uh, the, the problem is deeper than individuals. It, it's a governance problem, which has to do with the governing party, with our institutions, and a host of other, other problems. So I, I, I don't want to, to isolate him. I, you know, I do talk a lot about, about him because I was very angry during that time when I was writing. I was also very scared, as I say, yeah. about what was happening. And I think the, the Tlantanene incident really drove the point to me that, uh, the, about the importance of, of leadership. In, you know, that, that was really, really important. And, and uh, when I look back at that, I think we dodged uh, some, some really, really uh, big bullets, you know, during that period. And, and how we're able to rally after this had happened. But, you know, it was a really, really difficult and scary period in the recent history of our country. Um, one of the countries that has become a case study when it, uh, when it comes to economic possibilities and, you know, accelerated economic development is Singapore which follows uh, quite a strict meritocracy uh, system. We as South Africans, perhaps because of our uh, political history, have tended to follow a cadre deployment uh, type of system. Uh, what lessons should we learn from the, the countries, you know, countries of the likes of Singapore, Japan, and others in terms of what system works better than others? Yeah, in, in this country, and this is very important. You know, we like to talk about a uh, state, a capable state, yeah. developmental state. We are about the only country in the world, in my view, that talks about it and does nothing about it. Yeah. We just talk, we have conferences and all those things. Uh, those countries, including Singapore, China, Korea, Japan, those countries, they don't talk about it, but they do it. Yeah. 
They know this is the, this is what I mean when I talk about governance. They know what governance is crucial. Governance is 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 indispensable uh, to national prosperity and and success. Uh, Singapore is interesting, and I went on a research tour because I was interested in how the country governed its state-owned enterprises and what we could learn from it. And uh, one of my pieces in the in the uh, in the book reflects on my observations about how they they did that. Uh, a less known fact, uh, which uh, uh, commentators in this country and elsewhere are not aware of, is that. A lot of what China, which China, China has done very well in terms of reforming its economy and state-owned enterprises in particular. But a lot of what it learned about the reform of state-owned enterprises, it learned from Singapore. A lot, Singapore is one country in the world that China watches very, very closely. Very, very closely. What it does, uh, they try to emulate because they know that Singapore represents the apogee, you know, the, 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 the epitome of meritocratic government. They have one of the most meritocratic cabinets, governance, uh, you know, and, and it's not just about governance, but it's, uh, it's a, as, as, as in a competence, but governance in terms of ethics. In terms of ethics, you know, people are well paid in the public sector, but they are well selected. They go through rigorous tests before they work in the public service. The public service is a source of pride. It's not seen as something where you, you know, you, you, you discard people who don't know, you don't want to need in the party yeah. or elsewhere. It's a source of pride. So this is what I wanted to highlight a uh, confidence about, about not just Singapore, but the other countries in, in, in Asia. And the, the reason for this is because the ANC government looks up to these countries mm. as a model. But the question that puzzles me is, what is it they learn? You know, there's been a flock of delegations. So many officials, local government, provincial, they flock to China. The question that always bothered me, what is it that they're learning from China? What, are, they, are they learning the right lessons from the engagements with these countries? And I guess it goes back to what you said. If, if you gain knowledge, but you not implement, it is as if nothing was, was gained at all. Yes. Yes. It is said that uh, water does not create the leak in the bucket. It simply uh, reveals it. What has COVID-19 exposed about state capacity and our governance? I think COVID has, has been both a curse and an opportunity. Uh, and uh, it, it created enormous harm, as we know, in terms of the economy, in terms of our society, in terms of public health, and we have yet to recover from that. Uh, we can still see the lingering effects of COVID-19. But it also provides an opportunity, uh, confidence, uh, which other countries have taken advantage of. Uh, in South Africa, COVID has provided us with an opportunity to drive change to do the things that we failed to do in the past. Because it's created all these possibilities. So all governments across the world you know, have been saying, this is an abnormal situation. We have to act and deal with the situation. And if it means we have to use unorthodox economic policy tools, we have to do that. It's abnormal. Right? We are going to uh, all these economic philosophies, conservative, you know, we are discarding them. We have to act. Right? So, uh, these are, these, this is an, a very important opportunity to, to reform state-owned enterprises, to remove uh, log jams in the economy, to uh, eliminate uh, you know, barriers to, to trade, to, to drive economic transformation, which we've been talking about. Yeah. It's, a, it's a big opportunity, but that has not been happening. And when you look at why is that not happening, it comes back to this a uh, theme that I'm emphasizing, you know, the central message. It boils down to leadership and governance again. The countries that have responded very well to COVID, there are countries that have done so well, you know, Taiwan, uh, Korea, Singapore, China, Germany, the Scandinavian countries. There's a common denominator amongst these countries, right? They have very strong leaders and they also have responsive public services, 
very strong and responsive public services. This is why they've been able to overcome COVID and, and come out out of that, you know, in a, in a very strong fashion. So we are, my worry is that we are losing this opportunity. Mm. We are losing this opportunity. When you look at the United States, President Biden and what he's been doing, you know, he's thrown out the old toolbox, economic toolbox. He says, no, we are going to spend trillions on infrastructure. We are going to spend trillions on schools. We're going to spend, you know, he's using COVID to remake the American nation, to remake the, you know, to also redefine the relationship between the state and the corporate world. You know, he has been taking on the corporate sector. Some of the uh, issues that have to do with uh, the, the way in which the, the, the business sector in the United States breeds inequality and all that, he's taking them on because he's using this opportunity. And he's recreating the, you know, the example of of uh, Franklin Roosevelt, who also faced a similar economic crisis, the Great Depression, in the late 1930s. And he also said, you know, laissez faire uh, conservative economic policies are not going to work. We've got to, we've got to have a strong state. We've got to do all these things. We've got to build schools. And, you know, and that's what fueled the post-war economic boom. This is something we should be doing in South Africa. But you understand why it's not happening. When you look at the current situation, we're in today. It's not happening when we know the answer. Yeah. It goes back to the leadership, the governance, the institutions, all those things. Nobody is preventing South Africa from doing these things. Mm. Nobody. To our online audience, uh, if you have questions for Professor Mills, uh, please type them through and we'll get them to him. Um, China's economic courtship of Africa has been met with some criticism uh, from various corners. You know, some have even gone as far as calling it uh, the recolonization of Africa. In the book, you take a slightly different view. Yeah. Can you uh, reflect and expand on that? Yeah. China is, a, is interesting confidence because, uh, and, and I don't want to paint China as, a, as angelic. Uh, you know, there, there are many problems that uh, have to do with uh, China's growing presence on the African continent. You know, the, the rise in corruption and, uh, and a host of other, and other, other problems. But China has also provided an opportunity. I've been, I'm old enough uh, to have observed this continent uh, and how this continent has changed over the past two decades or more. In the 1980s, when we were growing up, uh, Africa, it was what was called a lost decade mm. in Africa, the lost decade, you know, zero growth rates, high, you know, high uh, levels of indebtedness, uh, there was a famine in Ethiopia, yeah. and all, it was a terrible uh, situation. And things have changed over the years because of the political and economic reforms uh, that have been implemented, and, and also, uh, you, you know, the, the, uh, the, the changes that have been brought about, uh, you know, in business reforms and all that. But one of the positive things which, which I always say about China is that, interestingly, China has changed the way the world views Africa. It's a perv in a very perverse way. Some people don't understand that. You know, Western countries had withdrawn completely from Africa. They had already they had discarded Africa. They had, they had, this is a basket case. Africa is a mess. We don't want to do anything to do with Africa anymore. The G8 countries, they made all these pledges, but they did not act on them. Until China emerged and grew its footprint on the African continent, right? Through investments, through trade, the other things like uh, providing debt and all those things, and, 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 and continuous engagements with African leaders. That made Western countries take notice. So they're asking a simple question. What is China doing in Africa? So they realized China in 2009, you know, overtook the United States as Africa's largest trade partner. And so they're wondering, what are these firms doing? I mean, we have thousands of thousands. When China started with 600 companies, now we have about 10,000 companies and growing. So that has made Western countries respond because they don't want to lose out. 
in terms of market share, in terms of diplomatic influence, and all that. So that is why there is this battle. It's called a great game in Africa, the battle for influence, because they see China is, is influential, and also, so they are responding. The EU, Turkey, uh, India, and all those countries, they are responding. They also want to woo African countries. Now, what does that mean? What is Africa doing about that? Right? There's so much focus and attention on Africa. What is Africa doing about that? What, what, does it have a strategy to engage with its powers? Whether at a national level or continental level or regional level. It's another opportunity, you know, to exercise our bargaining power. But is that happening? It is to be said that when America sneezes, the whole world catches a cold. But what Corona has taught us is that it's actually when China sneezes that the whole world catches a cold. Yes. Can you talk about the, the dynamics, the USA versus China dynamics and what it means for the globe? Yes. There, there are two points, that, and this is an extremely important uh, point, uh, confidence. The first thing is that because of uh, COVID and the, the collapse of the global supply chain, so, you know, over the decades, a lot of companies, foreign companies, uh, mainly uh, American companies, European companies, and companies uh, from, from uh, the diaspora, the Chinese diaspora, they invested a lot of money in China. They made China a global factory. So, the, you know, all these things you saw made in China, it was initially through the investment made by those foreign companies. So they, they, that focused a global supply chain on China. But COVID uh, it broke that. And so when you say China sneezes, it's because we realize, wow, this is a very, very dangerous situation to be in, to be so over-reliant on a single global supply chain, yeah. which is China-centered, mm -hmm. right? So we couldn't get medicines. We couldn't get drugs. African countries are heavily dependent on China for the import of drugs, some of which we could even make ourselves. You know, it is estimated about 16 billion US dollars spent on importing. So we learned, oh, this is a serious problem. You know, and countries, companies also, you look at telecommunications companies in South Africa, like, like MTN and uh, Telcom and Celsi, they were fretting because they're so heavily dependent on importing inputs from Huawei, which is a Chinese telecommunications giant. So when there was this conflict between the United States and China, and Trump was hammering uh, Huawei, yeah. uh, uh, you know, CEOs, the CEOs of these companies, they wrote to President Ramaphosa to express their concern about how this trade war was affecting them because they're so heavily dependent on this. Now, that provides us with an opportunity, uh, because I don't want just to talk about the problems. How do we diversify the global supply chain, the regional su supply chain? How do we, within the Southern African region, on the African continent, create our own uh, you know, regional uh, uh, continental value chains? It's an opportunity again, right? So uh, this, is, this is very, very important. And I think the relationship between the United States and China will continue to define how the world evolves. We've got to watch it very, very closely. There's an African proverb that says, uh, when two bull elephants collide, it is the grass uh, that suffers. Yes. <laughs> yes. So I, I believe that perfectly depicts the, the USA versus China uh, conversation. They say that there is no success without succession. Um, mm. In the book, you, you speak about the deficiencies, uh, especially in our current government, of proper succession planning. We've seen with the last two presidents, the way that they exited office, yeah. it was in a, in a manner that maybe it was uh, not the best way for a president to exit office. What is your opinion, uh, uh, reflect a little bit on the succession uh, planning within the rol ruling party and what they can learn from uh, other countries which you've mentioned in the in the book. Yeah, um, I, I don't want to focus exclusively on the on the governing party. You know, when we talk about leadership and leader, leadership succession, we, this is not confined to public institutions, but it's also uh, it includes broadly, yeah. whether it's civil society, whether it's the corporate sector, and and this is a very big issue. 
Uh, books have been written about this. You know, how uh, the best leaders are those who are able to create opportunities for the next generations to emerge and lead. You know, they prepare for the time when they will no longer be there. And Maurice likes to talk about that. It's very, very important. Uh, and this, when I look at the ULP, I see that. Right, we are creating a new generation of leaders, and we are giving them all the opportunities, the skills, the expertise. We don't do that well uh, in South Africa, so it's not just confined to the governing party. I don't know to, right? Yeah. Although it's very pronounced there, as we can see, it's very, very pronounced, and it's deeply worrying. It's deeply worrying because South Africa is not a Mickey Mouse country. This is a very complex country. It's a modern industrial state. Yes, sir. In terms of its uh, you know, insertion into global uh, production patterns, in terms of the role that it plays in the global economy, it's a very complex country. It requires leaders who are well trained and well prepared to govern it. It's, a, it's even more complicated than other countries, you know, in the emerging countries, countries like Argentina and other countries. So uh, I raise that issue because I'm very concerned uh, that we are not doing enough to prepare the next generation of leaders to take on critical you know, leadership responsibilities, not only in, 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 in government, but also in the, in the, in the, in the private sector. Yes, sir. Uh, Democratic versus autocratic systems. You know, when we look at the, the likes of China, Singapore, and even Rwanda, which has been lauded as you know, an African success story, when you look at the systems within those governments, they tend to be uh, authoritarian or somewhat autocratic. Is that part of why they've become successful in that? You know, with that type of system, it may be easier to enforce certain policies, and is that something that South Africa can follow? Is it a necessary step if we are to see the kind of economic development mm. uh, that we want to see, that yeah. we want to emulate in those yeah. countries? That, this has been an ongoing debate for many, many, <laughs> for many, many years. I don't, I don't believe in that argument. I don't buy that, that argument. Of course, those countries like China are very autocratic. Um, uh, you know, I value my freedom. Uh, so there are certain things that we can learn uh, from China, but there are certain things we don't need here. I value my freedom. I, I like to use uh, um, social media, which, uh, which is uh, restricted in China, and I don't want to be walking around, you know, uh, thinking that somebody is watching me and all and so on. So uh, there are countries' confidence that are not necessarily autocratic, but that, that have done well. Right. So uh, when I look at a country like, you know, in the 1970s, to go back to the point that we sometimes think we are exceptional, Australia was, a, was in the doldrums, was in the economic doldrums. There were strikes. The economy was terrible in Australia in the 1970s. You know, uh, New Zealand, um, the UK, uh, the UK in, in, 1970, in the 1970s, even went with a begging bowl to the IMF because it was experiencing severe economic problems, right? You know, the, uh, it was a, a terrible country to live in. When you look at these countries today, you can see how well, you know, they've, they, they've done, you know, especially Australia and, and, and New Zealand, uh, you know, the Scandinavian countries, they've, they've done very well. They're not autocratic, right? So we can still achieve success without being autocratic. I don't, I don't buy that notion. We can do it as a, as a democracy, as a free democracy, constitutional state, we can do that. But we've got to make sure that we have the necessary ingredients and do it. Um, in the book, you comment quite positively about uh, President Ramaphosa's leadership response to the COVID-19 crisis. What are the things that he has done right? Well, that, uh, I mean, that has been that has been questioned. I was in another uh, uh, forum, and some people thought uh, he had not done as well as I had uh, in, in reflected. Uh, and remember, in retrospect, there are certain things that could have been done better. So I wrote this during the time when he was responding. So this was 
uh, happening real yeah, in real time. And, and I responded to what he was doing. Uh, I think that one of the best things he was able to do is to use the consensus-based leadership style, you know, to rally support. And there was a time when there was so much goodwill was the government. There was so much, whether it was the, the NGOs or the, the, the traditional uh, leaders or the church groups, they believed in the president. They believed in the government. I think that was a major, uh, you know, a victory for him. But when we look uh, uh, what happened subsequently, uh, the PPE scandal here in Gauteng and elsewhere, uh, that was a, a really big blot. Uh, and then the big disappointment, uh, I had uh, seen the, the former Minister of Health, uh, Dr. Mkize. He was a, a shining star. He was, but we were really disappointed to learn subsequently and shocked that he was enmeshed in a host of these. So uh, I'm looking at this in retrospect. When I wrote, I was very praiseworthy, and I still am, you know, but I think over time, the certain things that happened that really disappointed us. Um, to quote uh, one of your chapters, I think it's a section more than a chapter, creating more walls than bricks. Uh, it's in chapter three. You comment on South Africa's joining of the BRIC grouping. And my question is, has it made, has it made a notable impact on our economic development? Yeah. Was it worth it to add the S yeah. on I the think BRIC? I, I'm not necessarily opposed to our membership of the BRICS. I think that was a a master stroke in terms of elevating the position of South Africa globally. And those are very important countries. Uh, noting, however, that China is the first among equals, uh, uh, you know, um, amongst the, the, the BRICS countries. My concern, uh, confidence, is that there's a tendency in, a, in our foreign policy to construct the world in very superficial terms. You know, to see some countries as very good and some as bad. You know, very superficial ideological impasse. To see the United States as bad, to see Brazil as good because it's, it's part of the global south. And that is not based on any rational, factual analysis, right? And I'm saying we should, uh, it's fine for us to remain within the BRICS, but we must all understand that uh, there are other countries outside of the BRICS that we derive more meaningful benefits from than the BRICS countries. China is, ex is an exception, is our largest, single largest trade partner in the world, uh, followed by the United States. So the United States, the policymakers and some uh, officials, they tend to cast it as an evil empire. But when you look at the trade relations, this is a very important trade partner, our second largest trade partner. And when you look at the trade profile, our trade with the United States is more balanced than our trade with China. Yeah. Because we export raw materials to China, we import finished goods. United States, we export very diversified uh, you know, exports. We, we sell cars, the BMW series, we sell platinum, we sell nuts, we sell wines and so on. So we, we derive a lot of uh, uh, benefits from that relationship. My point is that we should base our foreign policy on rational analysis. We should not use ideology and just talk about uh, countries as if some are bad, some are... No, we should look at what is in our national interest, what works for us as a country. Uh, in the book, you speak about the, you know, the fractured, uh, quote-unquote, uh, relationship between South Africa and Nigeria. The relationship between us yeah. and Zimbabwe, which has been tumultuous <laughs> at times, and um, and other African countries, can you share on the opportunity that you know intra-Africa trade, you know, has the opportunity that is that um, in the book you say we haven't really exploited it uh, or maximized it, and are uh, you know the the fractures within the relationship is it contributing to the low levels of intra-Africa trade? And what are the other factors that yeah. are? Well, I'm glad that uh, the president is uh, uh, He will soon be traveling to Nigeria uh, to undertake a, a state visit. Uh, and, and, uh, and yesterday, uh, we hosted uh, President um, Uhuru Kenyatta of Kenya. Uh, so that's a regional power in East Africa. Nigeria is a regional power in West Africa. So those are very important countries 
uh, Nigeria is now our single largest trading investment partner in West Africa. Um, and and uh, Kenya is our largest trade partner in East Africa. <clears throat> we, we need to grow the trade. We need to grow the investment. And we need to focus on those basic things that fuel trade. So the problems have not to, they've got nothing to do with high tariffs because a lot of countries now have reduced tariffs, but they've got to do with the fundamental uh, things, you know, like infrastructure. You know, the roads, the, the ports, uh, telecommunications, energy, all those things, customs procedures. You know, how long do uh, goods that we ship, uh, are they stored at the port? You know, it's unacceptable that in some countries it can still take 60 years, 60 days or more, you know, waiting to be, uh, you know, to be, to be uh, processed. So we, we've got to focus on the nuts and bolts of improving trade. And uh, a lot of African countries, as I say there, uh, African countries trade more with Europe, Asia, and the United States more than they trade with themselves. That is why you say it's called intra-Africa trade. So it's very low by global standards, about 14.4%, compared with over 70% uh, in the EU, which tells you that European countries trade more with each other than they trade with the world. So we need to raise the trade levels in Africa. And we, we have the opportunity to do so through the African, African continental free trade area. But it won't happen, confidence, unless we focus on the nuts and bolts. Trade is about, it's not about talk, it's not about communicating, it's about making it easy to do to remove hurdles, practically remove hurdles, invest in the infrastructure. We have an opportunity to do so. Um, you also mentioned, uh, you know, on, on business ethics, you said the infamous, uh, the Enron scandal uh, uh, sparked your interest in business ethics. And, you know, here at home we've had the likes of uh, Steinhoff yeah. uh, as examples of, you know, really big uh, business ethics failures. What, what, as you reflect on that, also uh, touch on what uh, business schools, such as the Vest Business School, what role can they play yeah. to ensure that uh, when, when people go into the business environment, they operate with a high level of ethics? Yeah. That's, a, that's very important, uh, and I'm glad you raised the, the question about business ethics because the, the issue of leadership and governance, as I said, is not confined to the public service. It also affects uh, the corporate sector. And we have seen uh, significant ethical lapses in the corporate sector, not only nationally, but also internationally. So the, the case of Enron gives us a very good glimpse into what happened internationally in the United States specifically. But we've also had our own experiences, uh, including uh, Steinhoff, which is uh, interesting, it, it bears uh, so many similarities with, uh, with, uh, with uh, uh, Steinhoff. I think th there are a few issues to, uh, points to make here. One is that what we've learned about corruption and malfeasance uh, in the corporate sector is, is that this is not just a developing country problem. Mm. It's a, it's a, it also affects developed countries. So a lot of the corruption that took place uh, and that takes place in developing countries. It's fueled by multinational firms, uh, you know, from, from abroad. Uh, so you have uh, the receivers of corruption and the purveyors of corruption. So if you are to deal with the problem, we've got to focus on both. Now, when you look at South Africa, uh, they look at the arms scandal in the late 1990s, and you look at the state capture, there's a huge uh, involvement of foreign companies, yeah. you know, like Thales, BAE, and all that. So we've got to focus on both, uh, you know, the local, but also um, a, a foreign company. So there's a, there's a problem of Western hypocrisy and double standards when corruption is discussed, as if it's an exclusive developing country phenomenon. Now, we, business schools have a very critical role to play. Uh, and I think Enron and other scandals really focused attention on the role that business schools were playing either in uh, propping up corruption or addressing corruption, dealing with corruption. 
uh, there was a lot of naval gazing about that in the United States, in particular, especially after I, it was discovered that Jeffrey Skilling, who was a CEO of Enron, was a, a holder of the MBA qualification from Harvard. Harvard. Yes. Now, you know, the, the business schools, we've realized, it's not enough, and the state capture has shown us, it's not enough to focus on building skills, uh, you know, uh, uh, expertise and all that. We've, re we've realized that, that we need to focus as much as on that business acumen, but equally focus on ethics, right? ethical leadership. Mm -hmm. This is a big thing. When you look at the state capture, the Zondo Commission, some of the people who appeared before the commission are extremely talented people. They're extremely capable people, like Brian Molifo. You could, Brian Molifo could walk into any job anywhere in the world, in my view. Right? But what marked him is ethical lapses. Right? So we need to focus more on ethics. And this is what we've been discussing at Vest Business School. It's a big, it's an important thing. You know, at our, uh, the MOU we signed, uh, we, we are going to sign with some uh, uh, you know, uh, organizations like the BMF is to focus on this, the emphasis on ethics. One of the, one of the things I always hear uh, Professor Khadavi says is, um, you know, talent will take you to the top, yeah. uh, but if you do not have character, you will come tumbling down. So I think, and um, you've mentioned, you know, it's a, it's a direction that the best business school is taking. So I think uh, things will, will there will be a shake up there in terms of uh, ethics. I, and I support you. I, I've got to emphasize this because I follow a, a lot of what ULP does, and, and we've had the benefit of watching some of the videos. Uh, you know, that have been recorded here, some really top leaders, put two months like, and, and everybody. And, and, and one common theme that has emerged from what I've listened to them, the integrity, it's everything. Your reputation, your integrity, mm -hmm. uh, it, it's, it's everything. If anybody takes that away from you, we are finished. Yeah. So I think it's something that we need to really focus on in a, in a strong and assertive uh, an emphatic way. In 2006, you wrote an article, uh, you know, when we, we say uh, professor, you know, the, the, is there, a, maybe there's a prophetic <laughs> <laughs> mental, crystal ball <laughs> mental there, because you wrote an article about how e-commerce and the information age would disrupt international <laughs> trade. And today, those prophecies, you know, have, have, have uh, are bearing fruit, uh, they've become a reality. How are we as a country and a continent faring uh, when you compare to the rest of the world in terms of taking advantage of technological advancements to advance our own economic yeah. agenda? Yeah, it, that piece, that was 2006. Yeah. And I remember when I submitted it, uh, the editor then, uh, that was business day, yeah. uh, he said, what, what is this about? <laughs> This is boring meals. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, I think it was prescient in, 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 in some ways because it foresaw uh, the growth of the digital economy. And, and now this is the way of life, it's the norm. And COVID has, has accelerated that. Even companies that had planned to introduce, uh, to digitalize uh, gradually, are now having to act fast because of the, the conditions that we find ourselves in. And, and to go back to the point uh, that you, we, we, we raised earlier about the opportunity this creates, right? The, the digitalization of our economies. Mm. What, 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 are, what investments are we making in that? So we're talking about in education, we're talking about uh, telemedicine and all those things. It's a, it's a very big opportunity for African countries, not only South Africa, yeah. you know, to, uh, to do this. And uh, the, the ACFTA provides a, a good uh, forum for us to do so. So the African Continental Free Trade Area. And I'm glad that uh, Wamgele Mene, who's the Executive Secretary, uh, a South African dip trade diplomat, you know, he has prioritized this. So this should be an integral part of the negotiations within the, the ACFTA. And when I mentioned this in, in 2006, yeah. I was concerned that there was not, e-commerce was growing, but there was no corresponding growth in the regulations, the regulatory systems, mm -hmm. to ensure that it, it, it happens in a good way. Uh, and that is still a challenge even today. 
We've got a question from uh, our own Chairman Prof. Khadeve. Uh, what is the role business schools, um, what is the role of business schools in building capable state? Business schools have a, a very important role uh, in terms of not only nurturing managers in the, in, the, in the private sector, but nurturing managers in the public sector. Uh, and we are well resourced in particular in this country. We have some very, very good business schools which, which uh, perform, and I know this from experience, they do very well in terms of teaching and training, even better than some top uh, business schools uh, in the world. So I think there needs to be greater collaboration between government and, uh, and business schools in terms of uh, developing or core developing programs you know that are suited for the public sector environment you know to to impart those skills the expertise but very very closely um, with the with the with the private sector uh, in that and i think that there are also opportunities uh, in terms of seconding uh, you know some of our staff to to act as knowledge partners because we are in the business of producing knowledge. Yep. That is our fundamental uh, business, right? And we can act as a good knowledge partner with, with, a, with the government, right? Uh, but that must be based on a mutually, benef it must be mutually beneficial, but it's not be one-sided, right? So we, we could do that. Uh, we, could, we, could, uh, uh, we could train managers, you know, we could, uh, uh, help with it. There's a lot of things that we could do with research, for instance, uh, that is geared towards addressing some of the, the problems. So we could also work with other faculties and departments because, you know, business schools are small. They can't do everything, but they can work very closely with other business schools, with other faculties, whether it's in science or, or, or in commerce and all that. You've uh, spoken um, about the lost years. Um, of yeah. in Africa, you know, and you know, for many years, we, Africa was known as the dark continent, uh, famine, wars, corruption, and the likes. Has the political climate on the African continent reached a point where Africa can develop at the rate of its true potential? Yeah. Or are they, those barriers are they still yeah. standing tall? Um, uh, Africa is, for me, it's better today than it was during the 1980s. Um, they, and that is because of the changes that have taken place. Mm. Some of them are political changes. There are more democratic states in Africa today than undemocratic states. Mm. You can quibble over the substance of the, the democracy, but there are more democracies than um, uh, undemocratic states. And apart from the political reforms that have happened, a lot of African countries have undertaken economic reforms. All those things that I'm talking about, you know, business reforms. How long does it take to open a business mm. in a country? How long does it take to uh, to store uh, goods at the port? All those things. How, lo how long does it take to file for bankruptcy? Mm. Those are fundamental reforms, and a lot of countries have undertaken them. And some they have done better than others. You know, countries like like Rwanda, Mauritius, uh, they are leaders when it when it comes to those changes uh, that have taken place. Um, and there has been the China effect, and, and you know it has been positive and negative. I've already spoken about how positive, but the, uh, there's a lot of investment coming into the continent. Although it's not diversified, it, it goes mainly into mining, and so we need more investment in other sectors, services, and all that. So it's a very mixed picture uh, uh, confidence. There's been a lot of progress, but Africa is still faced with a lot of challenges. Yeah. It's still marginalized in the world economy when you look at the percentage of global investment flows, mm. the global trade flows is still very marginal compared with other uh, regions in the world. Although it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a fast-growing uh, you know, continent after, after Asia. So we need to focus on all those things, uh, address the, the remaining problems and the hurdles, and also deal with it. There have been some regressions, for instance, in the last two years, uh, we've had some setbacks. Yeah where there have been some military coups in some countries, uh, and in, in Sudan, in Chad, and all those countries. So it's a very mixed picture. But 
overall, I think Africa is better today than it was when I was growing up <laughs> in, the, in the 1980s, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Professor Mills, just your closing remarks uh, in terms of the book. Uh, uh, you know, you've, you've spoken about what prompted you to write it. Yeah. Why should people read it? Thank you, thank you for the for the opportunity. I uh, this book means a lot uh, uh, in the sense that it it focuses on issues that I personally consider to be very important that have also bothered me for for many years, and uh, these are issues that I wrote about during a, a defining period. Uh, you know, since the the onset of the Industrial Revolution. It's a very defining period. A lot of changes took place uh, in the world. You know, whether it's the, the birth of Facebook, uh, the launch of, you know, all these the, uh, fundamental sure, yeah. changes, yes. You know, the growth of the sharing economy and all that. So it's been a defining period. And I think um, what I want to highlight here is that we, and I repeat the message, we are not exceptional. Right. We're not exceptional as a country. Uh, we're faced with challenges, but so are the countries uh, faced with, uh, with challenges. The key thing is how we deal with those challenges. And uh, I go back again to the central message of the importance of leadership uh, and governance. And uh, I hope that uh, uh, you know, those who buy the book will, uh, will uh, learn from it uh, and, and be able to absorb the central message that is conveyed therein. Uh, Professor Mills, our favorite quote here, uh, which Professor Harari started to say is, until the lion learns how to write, every story will glorify the hunter. So thank you so much <laughs> for penning your insights and contributing such value uh, to the body of knowledge. We are really blessed as a country to have somebody of an intellectual caliber. Uh, so thank you so much, uh, Professor Mills. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Confidence, and thank you, Professor Hadebe, and everyone uh, who's, uh, who's here in the production house, as well uh, as at home. I really appreciate the opportunity, and I'm immensely grateful. Mm -hmm.